So just by the way of introduction, I'm Mail Deep from Sotheby's and uh, I've been in this industry now for 15 years and I've been working on the modern and contemporary Arab and Iranian sales for the last 13 years. So this is very much my specialty and my field. And um, we're gonna try to take you on an overview of the movements that happened. I can't speak about all the hundred years and what's happened, but we're just gonna touch upon some important movements and why they're important and discuss them. And since we're not that many, I'm happy to take questions in the middle. It doesn't have to be uh, so regimented. So just by the way of like the, just to make it easier. If you, excuse me, I'm just gonna open the presentation on my phone as well, so I don't have to look back. Yes. You can take photos of the slides, you can do whatever you want. Okay. So I'm just, so this is something we, we sort of used as our, so just also there's no curriculum at present about modern and contemporary Arab art, doesn't exist. So we sort of created this as a rubric for us internally to talk to our new interns, to discuss with anyone who's interested and, and this is basically our assumptions. So just bear in mind that this is not a, uh, this is not a research-based uh, project. This is not something academic, but this is what we have surmised after 10 years of working in this, in this field. So the timeline, as you can see, and how everything sort of has political, key political events, the geography of the Middle East in the 1920s, what is modernism and how we, can we define modernism, and then we move through some of the movements of the 20th century of modernism, then what is contemporary art today, the market and what we're seeing in the market and some observation. Okay. So there's a very clear definition of what is modernism and what is contemporary art in the West. So everything that is post World War II in the West is recognized as contemporary art or post war art. This definition is not as sort of um, clear cut or clear in the Middle East. We don't have a defining moment that says anything after this moment can be defined as contemporary art. Usually what we have sort of defined as contemporary art are things that are happening post-1979. And the reason for that is that 1979 was a crucial moment and a crucial year throughout the Middle East. 79, you had the attack in Mecca for Jahaiman, you had the Islamic Revolution in Iran, you had the Egyptian Peace Treaty with Israel, you had a lot of key moments of history throughout the region that sort of triggered a lot of events and escalated a lot of events, and that usually resonates in the art world and usually resonates in the art scene. So. Basically, we've sort of tried to define art as pre-1979 to be modernist, even though for a lot of the, let's say for a lot of, uh, for a lot of academics, it's a bit late because 1979, you're already deep into the contemporary art world in the, in the West because it's the contemporary art world there starts from 45. But from 45, you still have a lot of artists in the Middle East practicing a form of modernist art. So. Um, so that's just to say it's still fluid, it's not as concrete, and it's something that I'm happy to discuss because I don't think it should be that linear or that sort of straight, straight cut. So this is just um, a basic timeline of the middle 20th century Middle East. As you can see, it's, um, it's quite turbulent, uh, not, uh, not that peaceful, but it's uh, an uh, evaluation of the last hundred years of what has happened, and as a result of, of these events in the last hundred years, you can really see an impact on the artistic practice of these artists due to these events, because no artist is practicing without politics. No artist is practicing in, in a vacuum. There's always this like underlying political undertone that influences the artist's practice. So just as you can see, the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire in 1908, the idea of the nation state. So with the idea of the nation state, and you see it uh, as um, a very important identity and important reflection in the artistic practice of a lot of artists, this idea of me as, as an Egyptian. So now I need to identify what it means to be an Egyptian, what it means to be a Syrian, what it means to be Lebanese. Also Sykes-Picot plays a role in this. Everything, it evolves. So everything evolves as as po following these political movements. Definitely that you have a pan-Arabist movement in 1952 with the rise of Nasser. Uh, you have with the, the Israeli wars, you have four Israeli wars. So 
everything sort of, the, there are a lot of key moments and they also define the, the artistic practice and the artistic movements that we see. This is just uh, a map <laughs> that we found, and I don't even remember where we found this because we found it a long time ago, about the colonial powers that existed during the 19th century in the Middle East. And as you can see, the, the Europe and the West were very much present throughout, um, throughout the Middle East. And that's also to go to say, um, a lot of these artists had these exchanges with these countries. So you see a lot of artists, let's say from the Levant, where France was there and France was very active, where you were educated in France. Or you see a lot of the Algerian artists having this exchange with France, because uh, Algerian artists having this exchange with France because of the proximity. And also Algeria was just another department in France. It was like something uh, complete. It wasn't even uh, a situation where it was conquered. It was actually France. Algeria was not, uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't like Egypt and England, it was it was like going to Marseille, you were going to Algeria, it's part of France. So we thought that this was very interesting because we thought also this shows you a reflection of, of what the countries were like pre the idea of a nation state. Bear in mind that even though that you had all of these European countries conquering them, they were all part of the Ottoman Empire still. So there was this dynamic between Ottoman rule and Western colonial power trying to be present in countries and yet these countries trying to fight for their national identity. So I think that's very interesting and it's very reflective of, of what we see happening in these countries. So what is modernism? And, and again, by no means is this uh, definitive or, uh, or, the, the absolute, um, or the absolute definition. This is basically what we used and what we surmised after many years of working in this. It's a, it's a very, uh, it's a reflection and a link between the social and political unrest. Um, it's synonymous with the idea of the nation state uh, and building, and there's sor you sort of see a lot of replicating of these European institutions, of cultural institutions in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, and in Lebanon, uh, art schools, the beginning of art schools at the turn of the century. Um, also using this cultural and social identity in establishing uh, an, uh, a sort of a new, vernacular, this modernism and, and being a new nation state and sort of removing this idea of the Ottoman Empire. It's the collapse of the, the Islamic caliphate for, per se and the idea of a modern state. And then we have establishing clear artistic viewpoints and merging of local iconography with the European practice of art, like how they can become painters and how they can become artists, what not. If anyone has any questions, please stop me. Or for example, this is a painting by Mahmoud Saeed here, the dervishes, which was part of the Hani Farsi collection, which, sold Christi, which was sold by Christie's, not Sotheby's, sadly, and is now part of the collection at Mat'haf in Qatar. And it, it remains to be the highest painting ever sold at auction at $2.2 million. So basically colonization, fragmentation, political unrest, gender, self-censorship, identity, and modernization as elements and themes that we see throughout the practice of, of modernism. So I wanna touch upon the first school per se, in, which is in Egypt, 1908. And it is in 1908 that we see the establishment of l'Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Cairo. And this was established by Prince Yusuf Kamil, uh, a, a royal from the Muhammad Ali dynasty who decides that he is interested in the arts and uh, basically uh, creates his palace, one of his palaces and, and starts the whole art program and the art school there. And this, is, this was just a philanthropic sort of project for him and it was the beginning of, let's say, patronage for us to see a form of patronage in, e in Egypt. Uh, Mahmoud Mukhtar, for example, didn't attend the school but ended up studying in France. And he loves to say that he thinks he was the first sculptor after the pharaohs. So he's the first Egyptian sculptor post pharaohs. Because it's true, if you look at the Egyptian history and if you look at Egypt's long, long history, after the pharaonic civilizations, you don't see many sculptures uh, in, in our culture and you don't see many, um, any examples of that. And Mahmoud Mukhtar uh, in the 1920s 
creates this amazing and massive, if you've ever been to Cairo, uh, sculpture, Nahdat uh, which is a beautiful example. And it's also a reflection of the nation state. So it's Egypt looking towards the future, it's Saad Zaghloul, it's the Weft Party, it's a lot of things. And his, his idea was that there was this, and I'm sorry, I don't have an image of it, it's this Falaha, which is an Egyptian peasant, standing, holding onto a sphinx, which is Egypt's past, Egypt's heritage, which is the pharaonic heritage, and she's sort of holding a veil and unveiling it, looking towards the future, looking towards a new identity, a new path, a new Egypt. And this is probably, in my opinion, one of the first examples of public art in, in the Middle East, where it was actually funded, initially the funds came from the Weft Party, which was the ruling party at the time, and uh, basically they ran out of money, and at the time Mahmoud Mukhtar ran an ad in the Ahram newspaper and asked the Egyptian population to donate and to contribute. And that's what happened. Everyone contributed towards the sculpture, and the sculpture is still there, present in front of Cairo University in Giza. So it's still there for everyone, made of granite and a very, very powerful piece and symbol for Egyptian modernism. Raghib Ayad is another example of these young, uh, of the first cohort or the pioneers of Egyptian modern art. He uh, very much used the vernacular of Coptic art and, and sort of started working with frescoes. And he studied in Italy because he was learning about all of these. Um, he, he was hired basically to start with fresco cleanups in the tombs of the pharaonic tombs and then started creating his own vernacular about how he can convey Coptic art or the Coptic identity in his artwork. And it's very, he's very unique and a lot of his artwork takes a religious connotation which you don't see amongst any of the Egyptian early pioneers. So it's a very interesting dynamic and a different facet and he ends up being one of the professors at the University of Fine Arts. Yusuf Kamil, as you can see, also one of the pioneers, sort of embraces a 19th century European look, completely, complete 19th century European look. Like this could, because he studied in France as well, you have this idea of him painting like his counterparts, and even the look is not even a fully Egyptian look, you know, it's a very, very European look, and, and he is not someone to be discounted, he's not someone to be ignored, but he is someone that's different, and that was part of the first generation. What's interesting, though, is that market-wise, he has the weakest market out of all three artists I've discussed, and I think it's because he didn't probably embrace a vernacular or a language that is unique to him and unique to his own identity. If you have questions, yes. Yes. So I, th I personally think peasants were a big theme in his work because basically the Egyptian falaha or the Egyptian peasant, at the time Egypt was very much a farming country. It was, farming was very much part and parcel of the economy. So this, one, this was part of the identity of the Egyptian person. So it was, an Egyptian person was a farmer, was someone, the, it was the rise of cotton, for example, at the time. It was, cotton was known as white gold. So it, it was part of the identity and it was the main, you had like a huge chunk of the population who were farmers. So it was sort of embracing that this is synonymous with what it means to be Egyptian. And then I go to Iraq, where we talk about the forerunners. And in Iraq, it's very interesting because unlike Unlike a lot of the other I institutions, they, whether it be Abdul Qadir Rasim or Asim Hafiz, they were military men. And they were military men, part of the Ottoman Empire army. And they studied in Turkey. So once they studied in Turkey, they came back with also this Turkish European way of painting. And it wasn't, um, when we look at Iraq, it is only in the second generation, which is the modern art group of Baghdad, that we see a departure from this and a new language. But here, both Abdul Qadir Rasim and Hasim Hafiz, Fayyat Hassan less so, because Fayyat Hassan sort of becomes part of the modern art group. So he, he is part of the first generation, but he also links with the second generation. So his artistic practice changes. But they very much embrace how it is that they want to show the Tigris and the Euphrates, how they want to uh, display the landscape in Iraq, and how they want to always be displaying the national costume, the, the, the people who are living in Iraq, the dif diversity of Iraq. And that was very much part of the artistic practice that we saw from Iraqi modernists on the in the beginning. Can I ask you for water if you have any? Sorry. Okay. Please stop me because there's a lot of stuff and I'm, gonna, I'm going a bit quick, okay? And then, uh, 
so in tandem, like if you look at the years, this is 1931, 1938, it's, Iraq is still uh, a royal kingdom. It's still very different than the Iraq we will see later on. And also I want you to bear in mind that for Egypt. So politically how these things, thank you very much, how these things differ and how these things impact the artistic practice of individuals. I'm sure, I'm not sure if you guys have heard about them and I'm not sure if you guys had seen these exhibitions, but this is probably one of the most important artistic movements in the Middle East before 1952. So Gamat al-Fanna wal as they are known, the art and liberty movement, the art and freedom movement, is the only movement to date right now that has had a historical retrospective in several museums. So the, the curators, Sam Bardawil and Til Feltrath, had sort of tried to recreate the five exhibitions that this group had in Egypt. And the first show happened at Saint Pompidou, then it moved to Reina Sofia, Tate Liverpool, um, Moderna Musit in Sweden. It went to six different museums in Europe, K20 in Dusseldorf, trying to rec rec recreate these, these five seminal exhibitions that these, this group of artists created in Egypt. And why are these artists so important? So 1938 is the beginning of World War II in Europe. It's the beginning of the rise of fascism in Europe. It's the beginning of a time that is very dark on European history. In opposition, it's a time of extreme liberalism in Egypt. It's a time of extreme freedom in Egypt. And these artists see what's happening in Europe and see this, uh, the rise of N Nazi Germany and how they rejected the art movement and, and Mussolini was rejecting these artists. And they write a manifesto together under the, the guidance of this intellectual called George Hinein, and they say, yaskut, yaskut al al So Hitler said, yaskut, yaskut al al and they said, they long live degenerate art, and invited all these artists that were in Europe, come live in Egypt, come practice in Egypt, and come paint in Egypt. At the time, also, Egypt was a base for the British for World War II, so there were a lot of elements that were sort of disruptive in Egypt that these artists sort of wanted to reflect on, whether it be what was happening with with po politically or uh, women or and and you see different facets of their artistic practice and just artist artistic output reflecting their anger towards what was happening in Egypt, but they were able to practice freely and independently without any censorship, without any form of uh, sort of revolt against their work. But their work was reflecting a moment in time, whether it be they were against what was happening in Europe, this rise of fascism, or they were against things that were happening in Egypt which was, were not on par with what they believed in. So they, they were very much um, in conversation with the global surrealist movement. This is a picture of the Art and Liberty group, and uh, George Henin is the, the gentleman in the back, as you can see with the glasses, who's like peering onto the easel. I don't know if you guys can see him in the very, very back. And then you have Ramsi Sunen, who was part of one of these artists, Kamil Tilmiseni, who I'm sure if you're in the, into Egyptian movies, the Tilmiseni brothers ended up living in Beirut uh, because they were living in exile post Nasser and were creating movies there from Beirut. Ramsi Sunen lived in France as well. But they were surrealist artists and they were in conversation with the global surrealist movement. They spoke with André Berton. They were very much part of this global surrealist movement, and Lee Miller, even if you heard of her, who's a very important surrealist photographer, British photographer, was living in Egypt at the time, she was married to an Egyptian, and was very much part and parcel of this group. Any questions? Stop me, please, if you have questions. Yes? No? Okay. So this is the second, second movement in Iraq that is also very important and very crucial to talk about, which is called the Baghdad Modern Art Group. This is the second group that we see in, in, in the Middle East that creates a manifesto, the Baghdad Modern Art Group. I'm sure you will recognize a lot of them, Jawed Selim, especially the work, even though he died at a very young age, Nazb al Hurriya, which you find in Tahrir Square in Baghdad, um, sort of was a reflection of post-revolutionary Iraq, Iraq after the fall of King Faisal. So you have in, in this all this socialist sort of Russian USSR uh, so propaganda and ideas. He never, um, he didn't see it completed because he died before the completion. But I'm sure if you, if you switch on CNN <laughs> at any point, this is the one image you see of Baghdad all the time over and over again. But he wanted to show a new 
a new Iraq. And the new Iraq was also an Iraq of science, an Iraq of education, an Iraq of uh, that l also looked back to the Mesopotamian culture. It wasn't an Iraq that was vacant of that. And it was an Iraq also that looked at the Abbasid culture, because they were also obsessed that at the time this was probably the peak and the pinnacle of Iraq, of Baghdad. Qazim Haidar, and this is someone who also has a different vernacular, Qazim Haidar is, comes from a Shia background. So a lot of the work reflects the, 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 the disaster of Karbala, what happened between the Hassan and Hussein. And this one is called the Martyr's Epic, and it had these 12 horses who are crying, and in the back there was always poetry in his artwork. So he was also someone who, who wanted to show his identity, his history, which was, was sort of not available or applicable prior to that. Shaker Hassan al Said is another artist also, and most of Shaker Hassan al Said's work was reflecting Mesopotamian culture. So how it was that the moon was involved and, and trying to look at a lot of the relics that we see that uh, that you end up seeing in the Pergamon in uh, in Berlin, for example, and, and how you can reroute this ancient history to your modern history and your idea of a nation. So I think it's very interesting when you look at those, and I don't know if any of you were able to catch the recent exhibition at the Museum of Islamic Art called Baghdad, which tried to showcase a whole history of Iraq, as a especially Baghdad, as a city, and then culminating with the contemporary art that you see now. Also, again, on the topic of the market, the market is very much dominated by Egyptian modernists and Iraqi modernists. And one of the most important Iraqi modernists is Mahmoud Sabri. I don't have a slide of his work. And we have sold two works by Mahmoud Sabri, one of them being the highest achieved at a million pounds. Mahmoud Sabri, a lot of his work was about what was happening with the Ba'ath Party, what was the struggles, and against, uh, because prior to uh, this, uh, Saddam Hussein coming into power, there were a lot of revolutions and uprisings in Iraq until the idea of the nation state. So a lot of that was reflected, but he studied in Prague. So the, um, the work is very much socialist and realist, like you see in Russian paintings. And then he departs from that completely and starts dealing with quantum physics, so it becomes complete abstraction. Shekhar Hassan Saeed also becomes a completely abstract artist. So it's very interesting when you see how they completely shift from how they started to embrace what is actually a norm in a global movement. Because at the time, abstract expressionism and ex abstraction becomes very much part and parcel of the global language of the art world. So for Morocco, the Casablanca School, 1969, and as you can see, it's totally different than, like if, even if you look at the Egyptian school with the Iraqi school, there are some, um, some underlying things. You can see a bit of similarities. You can see a bit of undertones that are, that are a bit similar. In Casablanca and in Morocco, it is absolutely different. The, the, there is, I don't think there's any similarity with the rest of the Arab world, and their language is, is completely different. So what happens there is in 1969, they decide to go to Jamal Fan in Marrakesh and create a public exhibition where they invite everyone to look at their art. And it's quite amazing because no one, does, no one did that. And they hung their paintings in the middle of the square and asked people to interact with, with, with the artwork and to look at the artwork. And some of these key artists are Farid Bilkahia. Farid Bilkahia, for example, if you go to Marrakesh to this day, he has a museum there, has an institution there, and you can go and visit and see his work. A lot of his work was referencing the Amazigh culture and the Amazigh identity. And unlike any other person I've seen in the Middle East, he paints on an, uh, um, a, natural, a natural living organism, which is the skin. So once, you once you're working with the skin, it's very difficult to manipulate. It's very difficult for him to work with it. And he ended up using a lot of natural pigment, so henna, cobalt, um, uh, lo lots of our the things you find on a day-to-day -day basis so he can create these languages and a lot of these, this new language of his on this, on this natural organism, which is vellum, which is the skin. And a lot of it is referencing the Amazigh culture, the referencing the Amazigh identity, and that was very much part of what he was trying to convey as part of the Moroccan language. Another artist from the school, who I'm sure you guys are very well acquainted with, is Muhammad Milehi. He was part of the Dar'iya Biennial in the first iteration. He just passed away this past year because of COVID. 
And he is very much, he's very interesting because he was educated in New York. And in, whilst he was in New York, he worked a lot with the op art movement. So a lot with uh, Frank Stella. He worked with a lot of other of his contemporaries from the movement there in New York. And there's a, there's a very famous painting that we sold which, sold, which was called The Blacks. And it was about his time in New York. And it's very different because like you see it was like a black space with like four cubes and it's referencing the skyscrapers in New York and the language in New York and how, how he saw New York at the time. As opposed to this where you have these curves and you have these lights and you have a lot of these different per reflection of, of a country where he lives, which is Morocco. And it, you see the differences in his artwork through the two different phases of when he was living in New York and when he moved back to Morocco. Does anyone have any questions? I wish I had more slides. I, 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 if you want to see more pictures, I have them on my laptop of when they exhibited in Jamal Fan, but sadly they did not. I did not include them in this um, slideshow. But what I think is very unique about the Moroccan uh, group is that they are very much in dialogue with the global movement. So they're complete abstraction in the 60s, versus the rest of the world doesn't. The, re the rest of the Arab world is not dealing with abstraction. You have in Egypt in, fif in the 50s, you still have Inji Aflatoun, who's still doing very much a lot of personage. You have uh, also in the other example is Lebanon with Saliba Dwehi, who does a lot of abstraction. But other than that, you find a lot of still people in, in, in paintings wor versus the Moroccan movement, which starts in abstraction and ends in abstraction. They don't have this idea or this need to have faces or not and I don't know why the case that ca that's the case but that's just how it is and that's how their movement is and then we look at how we transition and the art how the art evolves from regional to global here we have an example of Etel Adnan who's probably one of the most celebrated artists she is to this day the highest achieving artist female artist in the Middle East at auction and the price was um, I think I have it on one of my slides it's a red painting that we sold and she is, uh, but, but, but sadly, she's someone who only was able to see her success 10 years before her death. Prior to that, she has been working since the 50s and no one was even recognizing her work. She would be selling it for $400, $300, or like just selling it to giving it, gifting it to friends. So like for us to even accept her as an artist or to accept her, her excellence, it took a long time and, and she didn't really live to see much of this amazing uh, appreciation for her art. Serpentine show. Before it was still four thousand pounds, three thousand. It wasn't even. It wasn't the prices or the the, the fascination from the West. Some recognition. Exactly. I, I don't know what would have been the catalyst, for example, but the Serpentine show really p moved, created a shift in her career. And then the other shift was definitely the Guggenheim show. Because the Guggenheim show, for example, which happened three years ago or two years ago, and the reason the Guggenheim show changed her career was because the American market realized, oh, she's great, she actually has some American roots or a uh, connection with America, let's start buying her. So once you have an you have this introduction to the American market, which is the largest art market in the world, her market totally shifted and totally changed. And, and, and that's where we see this price shift, that she went from being an artist where we sell at auction for 100 to half a million. So the, the big shift market-wise is definitely the Guggenheim show. And the initial shift was the, was the Serpentine show, but, but definitely, definitely the Guggenheim show changed her market. And and uh, as I said, it, it's sad because she didn't live to see uh, the fruition of the Guggenheim show. 
and, and the Guggenheim show right now every single Etel Adnan that comes up on the market is snapped by an American collector because they 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 remember the story she was a California artist a lot of the work is referencing California so she's not only she's not only a female artist which is what a lot of institutions are now looking at un, uh, female artists who have been forgotten but she's also someone who had a big connection with California and and what makes her different and I think and I think it really sets her apart is that she wasn't only an artist she was a philosopher she was an educator she was a poet she she sort of was full circle she wasn't a very simplistic simple artist like someone who just because everyone always says but I can do that and my kids can do that or my kids can paint that but it's also a great um way to teach kids about art is like show them Etel Adnan paintings and have them reinterpret their own maybe you guys can do that in one of the kids programs because honestly like I did that once uh, in a refugee camp and we took like Saliba Dwehi paintings and Etel Adnan paintings which are like simplistic and I asked all the kids to recreate them and it was a great thing because like they were like looking and seeing the how they can be famous artists just by some simple process so I think it's something something you can do as part of the kids program but she was definitely someone who celebra who should be celebrated and someone who did have a shift in her career but very very later on Carmen Herrera is another example who's a western artist who didn't gain success until she was 90 and, and she lived to I think she's still alive at 102 or something like that so the other shift that we see is that art becomes a commodity there was never art has always been co a commodity art has always been seen as a way for you to have a, a reflection of wealth, a reflection of, um, of of stature, and patrons have usually used art in that way. However, in the Middle East, in particular, art becomes a commodity very later, that much later than a lot of the world. So you have it in the early 2000s, where the boom of the art market happens, and the boom of the art market in the Middle East is very much 2008 up until 2012, and then we have, unlike the rest of the world, where there was a collapse in 2008, our collapse happens in 2012, and then it sort of calibrates four years later. And now we're at a market where it's very stable, very calibrated, and prices are very consistent. So this is open to interpretation. Again, it's not defined, and it's, again, our definition and our what we've surmised. But what is contemporary art? It's breaking away from modernism, the 1979 revolutions, uprisings, and situ the situation in 1979. 9-11, you see a lot of artists who um, use 9-11 and, and, uh, and see what happened to, um, sort of to their culture, to their identity, to their heritage as a result of 9-11. Uh, social, political, and gender issues, the rejection of academia, you see that in the Gulf, for example. You see, in, especially in the Emirates, where none of these artists were part of an academic process, but mainly journalists or artists who are self-taught, whether it be Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim, whether it be also Hassan Sharif, total self-taught and being part of society and, and sort of creating art for the sake of art. International institutions, and this is the big debate. How can you set artists as being regional versus global? Uh, so as an artist, and this was part of the discussion we had where we had um, the conversation about women in Saudi Arabia, in the sa women in the ecosystem, Saudi Arabian women in the art ecosystem, how do you want to be defined? Do you want to be defined as a contemporary artist? Do you want to be defined as a Saudi contemporary artist? Do you want to be defined as a female Saudi contemporary artist? But what we're noticing over and over again is that contemporary artists just want to be defined as contemporary artists. They don't want to be pigeonholed based on nation, based on identity. They, they just want to be recognized for their art and their artistic production, which I think is very important. But then comes the concept of do you want to gain global recognition or regional recognition and how you can pivot from that uh, sort of putting someone in a corner and you don't want to put an artist in a corner, especially now. Uh, breaking the border boundaries and then academic and commercial definitions. So what we see also in with contemporary artists, for example, is a lot of institutional artists and a lot of commercial artists. So how can you have these institutional artists who you see at all the biennales, all the important biennales, whether it be the Atlas Group or um, you see Ryan Thabit or a lot of these Lebanese artists who a lot of the work is based on research archive and and this question of identity or question of what was part of their history and how can you make it commercial and how can you live with that artwork which a lot of people can't and it ends up being very much a museum collection in museum collections or institutional collections so these are just some examples of, of artists that are contemporary artists 
And those are some examples of what they've sold for and where wh what auctions we've had them in. So I'm sure you all are aware of Ahmad Motter's body of work. We have Hamza in the audience who can probably speak about it a lot more than I can ever speak about it. Um, a fantastic artist from Saudi Arabia and some one of the first contemporary artists of Saudi Arabia. And the reason I have it there is because I wanted to show the difference between these artists who are very much in the sa of the same generation, whether it be Ahmed, whether it be Walid Raad with the Atlas Group or Wa'il Shawi. Wa'il Shawi, as you guys know, has a piece here at the Biennale, which is uh, outside where you have the, the lamp posts that move. And I think it's interesting to see because everyone always asks about prices, and, and I'm, I'm sorry that everyone always asks about prices. I wish we didn't. But Wa El Shawi, for example, a lot of his work ends up being ends up selling much a hi at a higher rate in the primary market than in the secondary market. Because again, videos are not something that are easy to sell at an auction. Videos are much easier if you're selling it to an institution, to a collector of video art, or a collector of uh, of that kind of art specifically. But it's a lot harder when you come at an auction where a collector is, is not a video art collector or is not someone in tune with the market and how is he going to see the video or how is he going to... It's not like having a painting where they can instantly connect with it and buy it and understand it. But you have to be someone who's in an institutional mind frame or collects institutionally. Um, Walid Raad, for example, one of the artists I truly love, the Atlas Group, as you guys all know, is a group he created that's a fictitious group and sort of tries to chronicle what happened during the Lebanese Civil War. Um, always ends up being someone who's very hard, like even though this was a great result, someone who it's not easy to sell at the auction market. It's another, insu even though his, in his career it is one of the top careers of Middle Eastern artists in the world, he has institutional recognition, he's been bought by every major institution, he's represented by major galleries abroad, but yet, because the, 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 the language is so difficult, because the language is so politically charged, it ends up not being that easy to sell at auction. Versus Ithal Adnan, which is a much easier work to live with, or, for example, a painting which people can associate with, and, and it makes, I don't know. I, I, I still don't have the reason, or I don't know the reason or rhyme as to why some artists do much better at a market when they have so much success institutionally. And that's one of the questions that we constantly have artists that have so much institutional success and sometimes on the secondary market it doesn't, it's not reflected. So I'd love to hear your feedback, Hamza, being from a gallery perspective, I'd love to hear what, what is that and why that happens because I, I personally don't know until now. Maybe it's difficult to live with or it's something, it, it, it's still something that baffles me to this day. Also I wanted to bring in a whole set of female artists who we saw and we have seen have been doing well consistently and consistent and recently. Whether it be Itel Adnan, a 1970s work entitled California, and Itel Adnan's works uh, always touched upon where she lived in California next to San Francisco and the mountains and the landscape and everything was so, politi was so poetic and so beautiful. But again, if we had included this work, Sara, just to be specific, if we had included this work three years ago, it wouldn't have got to half a million dollars in any way, shape, or form. It probably would have gotten 100, 150. But the Guggenheim show pushed her to a different um, sort of standing. Samia Halabi, for example, is someone to watch now because Samia Halabi was another artist where we would always see around 20,000, 30,000 mark and not more. However, recently she's been, she's sort of being recognized for being the first Palestinian American female artist. Uh, her markets have gone up. She, she is part of a show at White Chapel right now about female artists. She also uh, got signed up by probably a major gallery, Sphere Semler, just signed her up as an artist. So that's also going to be a shift in her career. She was the first female professor of art at Yale, and being a Palestinian to, to have achieved that in the 70s is a major achievement. Another artist, a female artist who we included is Ito Barada, who if you had gone to um, the last Venice Biennale, she was representing Switzerland. And this is a, this is a lovely work which is called Play. Basically, you can, you can put these building blocks however way you want, shape or form. You don't need to keep them in this format. 
but it was uh, these building blocks were part of what the French were doing with the public, she reflection on what the French were doing with the public housing system in Morocco and how they were trying to make it more in tune with how the French public housing system was, not with the language of what it would be in Morocco. It's a very playful work, it's a lovely work you can live with. I'm not sure how easy it is to have it at home, but it's a beautiful work and, um, and it sold very well, in fact. However, my guess is this was in 2017. Now, following her success with the Biennale in Venice and representing Switzerland, was it Switzerland or was it somewhere else? I think it was Switzerland, I don't remember. And she has now full representation from Pace Gallery. That's also gonna be a major shift in her career. And then for our plug, Sotheby's plug, we are selling a wonderful collection come April 25 in London. So if you will be in London, please come visit our galleries from April 22nd, where we'll be showcasing this fantastic collection from the El Zayeni family, which has a wonderful journey of, of someone collecting from modern Egyptian to modern Syrian to modern Iraqi and a lot of contemporary art as well, Tanner Ceylan from Turkey. And it's gonna be a very interesting sale because it's the first time it's a single private collection that we've had in the last four years for one person who's been very dedicated to collecting in the region. And we're very excited about this auction and everything's gonna be in London and you can come see it and you can come enjoy it. And one of the, so there's Hayf Kahraman who's Iraqi Brit, Iraqi American, Gazbeya Sirri, and here you have a Salon style hang where you have also Hayf Kahraman, Saif Wanli, uh, Samia Halabi work in the middle, in, in the bottom le bottom right. Um, so we're very excited about this and this is gonna, the catalog goes live probably on, I think April 10th and the sale is gonna be April 25 in London. This is another shot, so we, like the shots look really good because like they're installation shots. I hope we can replicate this amazingness in London in our galleries. So our observations at the end, this is an example of another artist, an Iranian artist, Munir Farman Farmanian, who also had a Guggenheim show. Uh, despite the region being defined as a monolith, each country has its own identity. So that's very important to remember because I'm sure you see it all the time. We always, the, the definition is, oh, you're from the Middle East, as if the Middle East is just, uh, you're from the United States of America, you know what I mean? And, and as much as I think we share a lot of similarities, we have to recognize that there are a lot of differences in the paths that every nation has had and every nation has come to, to become. So I think it's important to recognize that you see that as a reflection in the art practice of every artist. So as much as I'd like to say, and as much as we say Middle Eastern art, it's very, very diff different because Lebanese art is not the same as Iraqi art, it's not the same as Egyptian art, it's not the same as Saudi Arabian art or Emirati art, everything is, is different and they're all unique in their own growth trajectory. So it's important for us to recognize that it's not one, one part of the world, like not one identity. We have a lot of things that keep us combined as like a whole region, but there are different paths to the growth of each artistic practice. Um, so this is something also that really, really bothers me. And I'm not sure uh, Ranim, who's a curator, it's something she pr will probably bother her as well. The one thing I hear a lot is that there is not enough research in the region or dissemination and of, of what is happening. And the problem is a lot of the research is published in Arabic. And a lot of the people writing this new research are reading only in English. So as a result, they tell you there's not enough written, when in fact there is a lot of lot written. And as a result of the wars, whether it be in Syria or Iraq, we've lost a lot of these documents. So it's so important for us to, to archive, to buy these old magazines, to buy these old documentations. For example, there is a magazine in Egypt which started from 1924 up until 1970, where on a weekly basis they had a review of every artistic exhibition that happened in Egypt. This is essential because this only tells you what happened, what, what was being exhibited, who was exhibiting, what were the works that were being exhibited. So it's so important and it's so, um, it's so problematic when we say there's nothing because then we say as if we have no history, as if we have no heritage, as if we have no art critics or curators, which we do. It's just that it's in a different language. So someone who's writing now at Cambridge or doing research now at Oxford probably doesn't have access to this. So it's so important for us to stress research does exist, but it's in Arabic. So learn Arabic so you can, I, here, I, he, here's a key example. I'm here and for me to give this presentation in Arabic, it would have been a struggle. But we need to look at our primary resources which exist and are very important. 
Um, issues of archiving and publication, as I mentioned. So definitely, definitely a library for modern Arab art is crucial and needed. So if anyone wants to start off this project, please, please do. And I will happily support it in any way I, ca I can. Um, division between Western understanding and the local perception of contemporary art. And, and that's basically something that we, we see over and over again when we have an artwork from the 1960s and you show it to a Western collector and they're like, oh, but 60s, this is so not, this is so modern, it shouldn't be modern. But we just need to also show that there's a different growth trajectory for the Middle East and that maybe our contemporary art movement started a much, at a much later po point, but that doesn't, that doesn't negate the fact that the movement exists and the movement of modernism maybe took a bit longer than, than let's say, modernism in Europe and in the West. Um, Neo-Orientalism and how to argue so I'm not sure if you guys see that, but, and I think this is actually a very good location for us to be, but how can you, um, how you can discuss the fact that contemporary art does exist in the Middle East and it doesn't always have to be this idea of um, art that's oriental or art that's fetishized or art that represents the Middle East in a way that the Western audience wants to see, but reflective of the language and the vernacular that is unique to this region. And then modern and contemporary, the complex de definition, I think we touched upon that. And why is Middle Eastern art so hard to identify? And what makes an artist, if you guys want to discuss? Does anyone have any questions? Shakrik عندك أسئلة. خالص? And this is a quote we really like by Professor Nada Shabbut, who I'm sure you all know her. I should answer you. Well, I, I, I actually don't think it's that, it's that defined. My problem is, my biggest problem is, when, when if an artist right now in 2000, in 2023 is painting like how Mahmoud Saeed painted and expects to be con des designated and contemporary, it's problematic because he's not in tune with, with what's happening in the world and or, or the contemporary art language. Yes. Uh, definitely in the early 2000s, it was all about conceptual art, video, uh, archive, research-based art, and you see that. But to counter-argue you, I'm not against painting, and I'm not against realist painting, because you look at Tanner Ceylan, who is a very realist painter, who's Turkish, and is a fantastic painter, but there's a new, there's an element of novelty in his painting. My issue is when someone is creating artwork that lacks novelty and wants this to be labeled as contemporary. Hot. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this is my question, always.
Very accessible. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I agree with you 100%. But the the problem is when art becomes a commodity and everyone is buying simply because I'm buying this so I can sell it ten, four years later, or even two years later. And it, it's it's about it. I think it's not great for the art market because at the end of the day, you should be buying what you love and you should be buying the artists you believe in. But but it, but things are 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 at a different pace and things happen in a different way uh, and that's just the market and the market can be very tricky and I think the market can be very harsh on a young artist and this is why my recommendation is for a young artist not to be included at auction because it can make or break a career of a young artist and as much as it can be a turning point for an artist to make a record price or to make some fantastic achievement it can also damage the career of an artist who has this path or growth path and and then at the end of the day it appears at auction and fails to sell and then you have all your collectors saying oh but I bought it and I thought he was a good artist but he's not selling anymore why is he not selling at the secondary market so I'm someone who really really does not like to have super young artists included at auction because I think it, it ends up damaging their career more than anything let's not Absolutely. A key example of that is Ahmed al-Sudani, for example. And if you remember, Ahmed al-Sudani was an artist who was so hot. Everyone was obsessed with him. The whole, everyone was buying him. The, mar the market prices, the auction prices had reached like around 800,000. And then in the span of a year and a half, you couldn't sell him. And, and it was a problem because it, it did a lot of damage to his career. We haven't been seeing a lot of Ahmed al-Sudani works on the market. We haven't been seeing a lot of... see him at biennales you don't see him at fairs you don't see him you don't see him at anything anymore exactly so i think it's also the role of of of, of collectors of art patrons of galleries and of, of auction houses like i i really really am against like including a young artist and some people think it's not fair and th some people think it's mean, but I think it's actually protecting the artist in the end of the day. Oh, thank you, Hamza. <laughs> you have a question? So I, I'm, I'm all for artists being included at gallery exhibitions, being part of exhibitions at, at galleries, at, at fairs. At that The problem with auction is that there's no control. So at an auction, if I were to put a work by James Dean, for example, like any, like 
and he's had two shows, but these two shows were sold out immediately, so there's a high waiting list for this. And these two shows, you saw an exact, his paintings were selling for $5,000 or $6,000, but the wait list is like 300 people. He comes at auction, people on the waiting list will get very excited, his prices will hit 100,000. That's bad for his market. And why is that bad for his market? Because he won't want to sell at 6,000 anymore. He'll want to sell at 100,000. But this 100,000 is not tr a true reflection of his market. This 100,000 is an ego contest between some people who couldn't get him at the 6,000 mark and want to buy him at the, th uh, and want to buy him irrespective. So you dis that's what I mean by destroying the market of a young artist at auction, simply at auction, not at a gallery, not, at a, not through an art fair, not through Biennales. I think, the galleries play a crucial role for these young artists and the galleries are able to change and revolutionize a lot of these careers of these young artists. I think it's just very important for auctioneers and for us as auctioneers not to flood the market with these young ha artists, especially in a, in a market that's not like as, um, it's not as, let's say, for like as mature as the Western art market. So let's the contemporary art market can withstand this because it's a very mature art market. Our art market is not yet at this level of maturity. How do we know our customers in what way? We don't. So anyone can buy. That's that's the thing. Anyone can buy, and if anyone can buy, that means you can jeopardize the career of this artist because it can be someone who's buying, who's looking to sell it for more. To, to, to we don't, we actually, a gallery is able to protect you as an artist and is able to make sure you're being sold to the right collector. As an auction house, anyone can buy because it's a, it's a, it's a reflection of the market and it's, if you can afford it, you can buy it. I hope that answers the question. I love charity auctions. I love taking charity auctions. And uh, if you guys have a charity auction, I'm happy to take it. But charity auctions are a fantastic way for you to give to a cause that you like and you appreciate and you want to raise money for. But it's also a, a great way for you to buy an artwork f for an artist who kindly donated this artwork. But it's not a reflection of the market because at the end of the day at a charity auction, it's two people who want to spend and want to donate. So. They're, they're spending not b based on the fact that they like this artwork per se, they will like this artwork, that's why they're bidding for it, but they're spending 10x or 20x because that's how much money they want to give to the charity. So I think it's very important for us to recognize that uh, a price achieved at a charity auction is not reflective of the market, but it's reflective of what this individual wanted to spend and donate to the charity. Benchmark. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Well, thank you guys so much for coming and sorry for the traffic. And always happy to answer any questions.